It is uh, great to be here. You know, Greg was uh, talking about how uh, we moved to Atlanta about eight years ago. We lived in San Diego for 18 years, and um, and he was right, man. You know, the two days before I left, you know, high pollen counts about 100 to 200, and uh, it was 8,000. But it's what produces great pictures like on the masters and things like what you see, but you can't breathe and stuff like that. But we moved, uh, is quite traumatic moving from California. We loved California, you know, in the air. And, you know, we had kind of that arrogance about California. Whenever we travel anywhere else, we had sort of jeer people that we, we lived in San Diego and just had this incredible weather and stuff. And I just want to warn you that, uh, that, God can revoke that blessing very quickly, okay? As he did us. We were just sailing perfectly fine, living on the hill in San Diego. And uh, I was speaking at this Billy Graham event, I'll never forget it, in Atlanta. And, and uh, one of my board members, she just out of the blue said, Doug, I think you and Tricia need to pray about moving the ministry out of San Diego. And I was thinking to myself, what you're thinking, like, are you crazy? Then I asked the business question, is that contingent upon your giving? <laughs> I'll pray about it. But what's so weird is I called my wife that night, and I said, Tricia, I said, Cheryl said the craziest thing to me. She said, you know, we ought to pray, da, 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 and the phone went silent. And I said, Tricia? She goes, Doug, I'm standing here, I'm feeling the ocean breeze, and I'm telling you no joke, just an hour before, it was as if God spoke to me right here and said, you are moving to Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, get out of here. Are you kidding me? You know, and then we had the husband and wife thing where you have to get on the same sine wave, you know, as far as, and then, but I'm a to-do guy. So I started making a little to-do list just in case, you know, it really was God that said something, you know, and, and, um, but we knew enough by that time to, to obey. And so, we just started listening to God, and, and I'm telling you, we would be in the gym in San Diego working out, and we just could not get away from it. So what happened is the lady would get up from the machine, would walk over, and she would walk Atlanta, Georgia, and it just kept, you know how that is? You can run, but you can't hide, and it would just keep coming and coming and coming. So the, uh, but so we, we ended up moving and uh, just have had uh, an amazing time over there. We love California, but... I remember my wife saying, we cannot talk like those Southern people. And so we recorded ourselves, and every once in a while, we do checkups and see if we're getting that slang or that kind of accent. But the spiritual culture is a lot different in the South, okay? I, the thing I liked about California it was a little more black, white, little, and you know, in the South, everybody goes to church. So you, you got a lot of kind of sort of religious kind of stuff to kind of dig through and uh, things like that. But we're going to talk about some good things. Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to get practical. We're going to talk about this uh, epidemic of Monday morning atheism that I walked through myself. I'm going to kind of do that in a story way of telling you a little bit about my own life. And uh, then we're going to check your switch. And we're going to kind of, I'm going to throw some of this stuff out here and actually let you guys uh, wrestle with a little bit. Greg just told you I spent uh, some time in Germany recently. And... Uh, Germany's really cool. I mean, I was in Berlin. Uh, you talk about a cultural melting pot, and also spiritually, if you think about, you know, Martin Luther and uh, Johannes Gutenberg, you know, the Gutenberg Press, and, uh, and all this amazing spiritual and, the, and, you know, the Reformation out of there. But at the same time, you can be standing on top of uh, Hitler's bunker and stuff. So there's, a, there's just a real, you know, ugh, edgy stuff. But I've always been impressed with, uh, with Germany. And uh, when you think about Germany, what do you think about German engineering, right? I drive, I drive a German car. I, I love German engineering. But I want to show you something that, um, you know, there was a, they were having some trouble with, uh, with birds over there. And birds were, uh, how many people like to get their car pooped on by a bird, right? That acid, if you leave it there, it'll just kind of eat a little thing. So these German engineers are amazing. They think about everything. And so they came up with this little device. And I want to show you, I got a little a clip of it. And I want you to watch the bird in the top left hand. Watch the bird, okay? This, you'll be seeing this uh, come in the U.S. auto industry very soon. Watch the bird.
That's German engineering. <laughs> all right, well, here's the big confession to start, all right? My name is Doug Spada, and I am a recovering Monday morning atheist. Hi. So, listen, I don't like to think about myself as an atheist, but you know, if I'm really honest, you know, sometimes my thinking and my behavior defy my faith. You know, and I've struggled with this for a long time, and, and you know, it's really interesting, you know, we, we did this research and over the last seven years, and we've collected about 300,000 data points, okay, on why believers like you and I and the people we live and the people that we're around, why we switch God off on Monday. What is it? Why do we do that and stuff? So we've collected the largest body of, uh, of data, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. That's what I want to talk about. I'm going to share some of that research and what we found out, and, um, and we're going to have some fun uh, doing that. Now, a couple things that we've developed from that data and that research, okay, is uh, there's small group guides. There's a lot of really uh, interesting kind of things that are in development right now that can actually help you identify where you may be switching God off and, uh, and things like that. Texting tools, and I'll show you some more of this a little bit later. Now, as Greg said, I have kind of a shady background, a top secret background, and uh, I spent uh, about a decade of my life, uh, this was my workplace, all right, and um, operated out of San Diego, mainly in the northern Pacific, up around where most of the Soviet submarine bases are up in the northern Pacific, and uh, I'd love to tell you more, but we'd have to kill you. The last meeting, three people lost their lives. So, but uh, if I get a little time at the end, I'll tell you a little bit of uh, some other stories. This is an Akula class submarine that we used to hunt constantly uh, in the Soviet submarine uh, fleet. This is, the, uh, this is the Sea of Okas. This is where we operated uh, a lot of our time, and we would operate out of uh, Alaska there. There's a, the very Alaska Illusion Island right there is Adak, Alaska, about 90 miles from Siberia. We used to drive the Soviets crazy because we'd pull in there. And, um, and then we'd sneak through the Curio Islands there and do what we do best there, collecting data and information and playing war games with the Soviets, which go on to this day. Just people don't know about it. And um, so if you read the book of Revelation, watch out for the bear, right? It's, uh, it's not going away. So we're, we're very active uh, in doing that. We also committed espionage. This is in the KGB Museum. This is something we used to actually uh, uh, listen to all the transmissions through the Cold War from the, uh, from the uh, Kumchaka Peninsula over to Moscow. And it's the way that we stayed ahead of the Soviets quite often because we could hear their missions and we could hear their problems and hear their girlfriend problems and all kinds of things like that. So it was um, today. That thing's a pretty big thing. Today, it would be about the size of this, right? You know, the technology is kind of advanced. So anyway, I've had the privilege of leading an organization called Work Life for about the last uh, uh, 12 years. And um, there's three things that we're passionate about, thought leadership and awakening, helping people kind of come into this realization that, man, their work is actually worship unto God and to stay switched on. But they don't have to switch off and kind of live this kind of segmented life. We also uh, develop tools that I'll show you later on. And then we also empower other organizations like uh, churches and, and ministries and different networks to actually carry on this, uh, this great mission. Really, it's about helping believers stay powered on. Powered on Christians. It's kind of like Biola's, uh, Biola's mission here is to actually send you students out into the world powered on for Jesus Christ, right, instead of switched off. Um, we're serving about 5,000 uh, church leaders around the world and about 50,000 workers in all kinds of different uh, countries. And um, went over to Asia last year. That was a lot of fun. So this is a, a campaign that we're in the process of developing called the Switch Campaign, okay? And it has one singular focus, and that is that one day of the week, Monday. If you can keep God switched on on Monday, there is a very good chance that the rest of your week 
will go the same because we all know how that Monday feels, right? You got that Monday, you just don't, you don't, it's, it's either, it's either you had a great experience and you're taking church or just a weekend, but there's a, it's a very operative, uh, spiritually operative day. And our ultimate goal is to help 10 million people keep God switched on. Last year, we reached about 4.9 million people, and uh, we're working in, in global partnerships to actually do that. We can't do that alone. Dr. Billy Graham once said that he believes that the next great spiritual awakening will happen through believers in the workplace. So I'm going to give you a little visual of what that looks like, okay? This is a story from, uh, that a church sent us in South Africa of a believer that works on a construction site. And he actually took this thing seriously and actually started trying to practice faith and say, God, move through me and work through me. And God was looking to and fro the earth and, and found this gentleman and says, you know, this is a serious worker in the kingdom. And so over a week time, this was just an amazing story, over a one week time, 40 people gave their lives to the Lord on this construction site. Now, this is New Testament Christianity. They didn't run for the church to try to say, let's get back to the church so that, so that we can kind of plug them into this, to the religious system. They didn't do that. They pulled up a bulldozer, they filled it, and all 40 people were baptized right there on the construction site. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine that happening in culture? I mean, I can tell you a lot of stories and stuff, but... That's what I think is, is underfoot. I think God is, is at work getting ready to absolutely use people that are already deployed in the marketplace, already deployed strategically as accountants, as attorneys, and you know, doctors, nurses, just all different types of vocations. Yeah, so it's, it's, it is all about people. But, you know, um, back to the confessions of a Monday morning atheist. I wanted to uh, just share a little bit. You know, I, uh, you know, I want you to walk with me for just a little bit. I want you to come back to, to June of 1975. I gave my, my life to the Lord, uh, 10 years old, and, you know, this is my very first Bible. I brought it to show it to you, okay? This is my Bible. So they gave me this Bible, and they said, Doug, you need to conform your life to this Bible, right? But you've got to understand, it was a really big deal when I came to the Lord, because I was, uh, I think God kind of moved in and saved the world from a, from a future terrorist, all right? So let me give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. You dads, who you know, will cringe, and moms, but I, uh, there was one time I'm in the garage. This was just a normal day in Doug's world, okay? So I'm in my garage, and I'm always experimenting, right? So I started experimenting with chemicals and aerosols, and I would create concoctions that would blow your house up, right? And uh, one time things got way out of hand, and uh, I created this chemical fireball that just flew 25 feet across the garage and actually burned a hole in the garage door, okay? So you can imagine fathers and mothers, man, coming home and pulling in your garage, and all of a sudden there's just this huge hole, man. It, my father was not happy. And so another case, uh, just to show you kind of my mind and the kind of the way I thought, um, one of my best friends who, uh, he was my best friend, he lived next door, and uh, man, he really ticked me off, right? He crossed the line, so I decided to, uh, to vaporize him. And uh, so, no joke, so what I did, you know, I had, I had even a little engineering mind back then, is uh, I'd watched enough on TV and learned enough about electricity that I, I decided to actually, back, back in those days, we had, the, we had these chain link fence all the way around the yard, okay? and these zinc-coated chain link fences. So I decided I, I was going to actually uh, create an electrical force field around the house. <laughs> and so what I did is I, uh, I took the pool filter, you know, the, we had an above ground pool and I took the electrical that went out to that and I unwired that and I took extension cords and I created terminals on our, on our zinc fence and I wired, I wired the whole fence, <laughs> you know, I didn't know a lot about electricity, so what happened is when I, when I executed my plan, I shorted out the whole house, right? And which was not good, it was another big uh, scenario. So you can see why at the age of 17, the United States government captured me, <laughs> sent me to a remote location, shaved my head, taught me nuclear engineering, and actually pointed me towards the Soviets and said, go get them, right? <laughs> So, 
So that's what, that's what my life was like. But, you know, you know the, uh, the thing that, uh, that I wanted to share, getting back to, uh, to the scriptures, is that I, uh, you know, when they gave me this, I was overwhelmed. You know, I was like, Lord, you know, what do I do with this? You know, and I'm starting to read, and besides that, it's King James, and I, I was just like, you know, this doesn't even sound like English. You know what I mean? And so, but I love, I, f- I figured out some things. I love the promises that were in here, right? And I claimed these, I was like, God's going to help me. But my little entrepreneurial mind, I just, I did not like everything in this book. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, I had to change, right? And so, as I looked through this thing, I just started thinking, okay, I like this, but I don't like that. And so I came up with another plan that I thought was brilliant at the time. So I took uh, magic markers and I created my own Bible. And so everything that I didn't like, for example, here in Hebrews, I actually took a picture of it so you can see this. In Hebrews where it talks about pain and suffering. How many people like pain and suffering, right? But sometimes God uses that, right, to actually conform us into the image of Christ. Well, I didn't like that plan. So what I did is I would just, I would cross out everything in the Bible. And I created my own Bible, right? So, um, but that's, uh, that was kind of, you know, and that's funny. You know, you're laughing because of the immaturity of a young child. But let me, let me tell you what's not so funny, okay? So some 35 years later, I still see evidence in myself of doing the very same thing. I'm way more sophisticated. I know not to take a crayon or a marker and just mark out the Bible, but there's all kinds of areas in my life where I just switch God off. You know, I mark him out. I switch him off. And, and our research shows, like I said before, that you and I have something in, in, in common, man. We all struggle sometimes with keeping God switched on. So let's talk about Monday. We talked about that for a second, but I want to show you a few facts that we've kind of uncovered about Monday and see what you think about these. Did you know that 50% of employees are late to work on Mondays? That's a pretty amazing fact, isn't it? What about this? Worker productivity rates are less than 30% on Mondays. How's that, man, for you business leaders, right? That's, uh, that's a problem. That sounds crazy to me, but it's like, uh, all right, what about this? Have you ever heard, I was in Germany, that's why there's something that Germ- in Germany, uh, the word for Monday is Montag. So I learned a little bit of German before I went there. But, uh, you know, this is called, they call it a Monday car. And I was like, what's a Monday car? And those are cars, I found out that it's similar to what we call a limit. And I didn't know this, that you know that worker productivities and issues on Mondays, that, uh, that you don't want to buy a car that was actually manufactured on a Monday. So that's why you'll never find, you won't be able to find the actual date. I didn't know that until I was over in Germany. I was like, wow, that's interesting because of some of those issues on Monday, okay? You know, most people spend 10 minutes or more each Monday morning moaning. So what's, what's your moan sound like, right? Go ahead. Uh, all right. All right, so most people do not smile until 11.16 on Monday morning. Not 11.15, but 11.16, okay? I don't know how they found that out. I want, to, I want you to watch this video. This is, a, uh, this is another video of what happens on Monday. I, uh, I don't like my job, and uh, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. You're just not going to go? Yeah. Won't you get fired? I don't know. But I really don't like it, and uh, I'm not going to go. <laughs> so you're going to quit? No, not really. Uh, I'm just going to stop going. Uh, when did you decide all of that? About an hour ago. Oh, really? Yeah. About an hour ago. <laughs> so are you going to get another job? I don't think I'd like another job. <laughs> what are you going to do about money and bills and... You know, I've never really liked paying bills. I don't think I'm going to do that either. <laughs> uh, well, so what do you want to do? I want to take you out to dinner. Now, the guy can't pay for it, but he wants to take her out to dinner. But on a more somber note, you know that Monday is the highest suicide rate on Mondays. Also, it happens to be the highest, uh, highest heart attack 
day. So there's a lot going on on Monday. It's a big transition. We all know what we all struggle with, right? Um, and then there's this epidemic of, of Monday morning atheism where we just kind of switch God off. And so what is a Monday morning atheist? We know what an atheist is, right? Someone who does not believe in God. The formal definition of a Monday morning atheist is someone who believes in God, but yet works like he doesn't exist. Has anybody ever done that? Love God, want to serve him, but you work like he doesn't exist, either accidentally, sometimes intentionally, but it happens and it's, it wreaks havoc as far as our spiritual kind of, uh, our spiritual goals and stuff in the workplace. So, but they're pseudo-atheists who think that they believe in God, but who in reality deny his existence by each one of their deeds. It reminded me of James uh, 1.22. It says, but, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like what? Glancing at your face in the mirror, right? As soon as you turn away and walk, you forget what it looks like, okay? But if you look carefully in the perfect law that sets you free and you do, say do, do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you. For doing it. So, who's affected by Monday morning atheism? Most all of us, right? At some level. So, let me introduce you to some of the, some of the people in the research and, and, and some of the things that we found. So, this is Peter. He's an IT specialist. And he says, I know I shouldn't ignore God at work, but it's so easy to do here. All right? Some of the other research we found is 90% of the people are struggling with work-life balance and are stressed or discouraged. 61% fail to see kingdom purpose in their work and are unsure about how to talk about Jesus in today's marketplace. Here's Helen, a real estate assistant. She says, I'm around so much conflict, you know, I don't know how to deal with this. Here's some more research. Only 38% think coworkers see Christ's character in them at work. Only 38%. Only 28% pray regularly for work associates. Only 49% had any faith-oriented conversations with coworkers in the past six months. All right? Here's Natalie. She says, I find myself being two-faced at work just like everybody else, and I can't seem to stop it. Now, we're going to do some stuff here, practically uh, checking your switch. I need to get another paper here. And so... Um, but before we do that, I, wanna, I want you to, everybody to grab your switch, Okay? All right, everybody got their switch? We're going to practice a little bit here first. Um, but I want you to, um, I want you, I want everybody to kind of switch on. Okay, switch off. Now switch back on. Okay, we got a problem in the room here. So some of you are actually switching on, but your switch is upside down. I just saw him turn the switch upside down. Isn't that typical of us, man? We think our switch is on, but it's actually off in a lot of areas, right? I just saw a lot of people doing this. Uh-oh, got it. You know, the green should be at the top, right? And so, you know, this switch actually, listen, it only, it, 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 the switch controls flow, right? Controls flow, turns on the lights. Um, you know, it only takes eight milliseconds to actually disrupt flow through this switch, okay? I want you to think about this switch as your heart, Okay? This switch represents your heart. Okay, and listen, listen to this. Here's the, uh, the way that we fight Monday morning atheism, okay? This is your heart, right? Grounding terminals are green, power terminals on the side, okay? We have to stay grounded to the truth and connected to the power. And then you have to keep your heart switched on. Allow God's flow, okay? So just remember that. I'm gonna, let me tell you a little bit about the principle of flow real quick. If you just let me use just a little bit of electrical theory here, just to, you, know, you know, for myself here. And, and the principle is that your resistance determines your flow. Now, this is what's called Ohm's law. You know, current equals voltage divided by resistance. But I want you to think about this for a, for a second from a, from a spiritual standpoint, okay? 
Current represents flow, the flow through your life, okay? Voltage is God's potential, okay? That's potential energy, voltage. And then resistance, the denominator, is, you know, uh, the resistance in your life. Now, the definition of resistance is the conductor. Think about yourself as, a, as God's conductor. How many people want more of God's flow in their life? Okay. In order to do that, though, God's potential, right, is, is there. That's constant, all right? The only variable in this equation is, is our resistance, right? So the definition of resistance is the conductors, your and I's, the conductor's ability to resist flow. So what happens when resistance goes down, simple math, denominator goes down, flow goes up. Your resistance goes down, flow goes up. Your resistance goes up, flow goes down. Okay. Now, you remember the scripture here in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Okay? All right, so let's check the switch. Everybody get their switch. I'm going to throw some issues, some real work issues, and I want you to actually switch on or off. And you guys are going to talk about some of this here at your table for a little bit. So let me, uh, let me throw this one out. You got your switches, everybody? You ready? You got them in the right position, right? Green terminal up. All right. Is my work ethic free from compulsions such as meaningless goals, accumulating temporary success, and a desire to please everyone? Switch on or switch off? Anybody got compulsions? Everybody switch? I didn't hear any switches. It's just, okay. Well, on would be you got, you know, your, your, oh, okay, you want to, I, I see what you're saying, Ed. Switch off would be your switch is off, right? You got issues in that area, okay? So, all right, so you switch off, right? Do I avoid the pitfalls of compensation and position discontentment uh, to maximize my impact for Christ? Anybody had uh, compensation discontentment? Switch on or off, all right? I know I've had that at different times in life, right? Okay, here's another one. Do I keep promises and tell the truth at work when subtle pressure is used to encourage hype, false appearance, white lies, and spin? Guys in marketing or sales, man, it's really hard, right? What's, how do you get there? Okay, here, do I effectively answer tough questions coworkers ask me about God, life, and faith? What about this one? Do I, do I effectively deal with a boss, a difficult boss, serve an unreasonable client, or cooperate with a cynical coworker? Anybody ever had trouble with that? Switch on or off? Now some, some of you, ladies, watch the guys. Man, guys have an incredible habit of hiding their switch, right? <laughs> so you can't, it's hard. I mean, we're clever, right? We're just, you got... Okay, what about this one? Do I effectively deal with lust at work, including everything from travel temptations to office affairs to sexual harassment? Mm. We could go on. So we've identified 30 top propensities for people to switch God off at work. So, you know, what we're going to do now, though, is we're going to just spend a little bit of time. Greg actually posed this before dinner, but... We're going to spend about 10 minutes, and there's two questions on, on the screen that I want you at your table to just talk about. Be as honest as you can, vulnerable as you can. First one is, what is your greatest struggle with switching God off at work? If you can share it, share that. What is it? I mean, how do you, how do you sometimes switch God off? Second one is in the past, give an example of a time you switched God off at work and what happened. I'll tell you some of mine here after we get done with the break. So go ahead and, and talk in your groups, and, uh, and then we'll start here in just a, just a little bit. So, All right, are you, you guys have some great conversations? Good, good, good. We're going to get going again. Man, we got, some, we got some switch talk here. All right. 
Hey, so what I encourage you to do, sometimes, uh, you know, when we're talking about, you know, you know, certain things will come to our mind about areas that we may switch God off. Some of them may be in your purview. Other ones may not be. So what I want to challenge you to do is um, this is a seven-day challenge for you, okay? First one is I want you to observe your switch, all right? For seven days, just observe your switch. Actually, take this physical switch. I mean, put it on your desk, carry it in your car, do whatever you have to just to think about it just to keep it kind of top of mind, all right? So I want you to read this book. We cut it in half, made it, took it down to an eighth grade level. But let the spirit, no, seriously, it's just because people don't read anymore, right? So you can get through this in two hours, and it doesn't intimidate. And so there's a whole strategy behind that. But I encourage you to read this. And then what I want you to do is I want you to identify your, your resistance, okay? There's a profile, and it's a, at a domain. You'll find it in the book. It's all over the place called StopTheSwitch.com, okay? And that has a free work-life profile in which it'll have these 30 indicators and a Likert scale, and you'll have to sort of grade yourself, and I promise you the Holy Spirit will start speaking to you, okay? And so unlike maybe at the table where you're like, oh, you know, what is that? Oh, yeah, one time I kind of cussed or I, whatever you're thinking, right? This will give you, this, this is almost like just putting an x-ray machine on you as far as your your, your work style. Behind this is a whole sort of theology of work. So we're, it's almost like just putting that right over you. And, and then it'll spit out your top three propensities for switching God off. And it'll send you a report in HTML or in, in an email, and then I'll give you an HTML report. So that'll do. Also, I've got hundreds and hundreds of cards. These are little teeny share cards that have stoptheswitch.com and a really cool little kind of thing in there that you guys take as many as you want to. I just, I'm not taking them back to Atlanta. So you can, you can use these and, and give them to other friends or coworkers and actually say, hey, I dare you to take this little profile. It takes about five minutes. And uh, it really helps kind of start conversation. Um, there's other assets that you, that you can download after you actually take the profile. Like every single one of these propensities the switch got off has a, has a work-life truth module. So that's a, that's a biblical path to actually help you resolve that issue of gossip or sexual temptation at work or, or uh, compensation discontentment or a bunch of other things, right? So uh, there's solutions on how to actually address this, not just like, oh, thanks for telling me how bad of an atheist I am at work, okay? That's not what it's about. It's just, but awareness is half the battle, right? Sometimes just me knowing, just like when uh, maybe a great friend says, you know what, did you know you cut me off all the time when I'm talking, you know, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I never realized that. That's what kind of this is, just an awareness of kind of what's going on. So that, that, will, uh, that will help you. So let me, uh, let me go past this one here. So what we found, uh, I'm going to go through these. these. This is a little bit more of what we found in the, uh, in the research, okay? We found three primary drivers, okay, that actually cause us to, to switch over into Monday morning atheists. We call them spiritual drivers or kind of wrong assumptions. The first one is only some of life is spiritual. I'm going to go through these a little bit. Uh, second one is my work is just a waste. And the third one, it's all up to me. I got to do it myself. Anybody ever had that? Got to get it done. If I, it's going to get done right, I got to do it myself, right? Ah, oh, man, that just absolutely is one of my greatest... Uh, False. Number one, short circuit, okay? Only some of life, we, in the book, it's called spiritual schizophrenia. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Monday Morning Atheist buys into the false idea that work is not a spiritual activity, right? This leads them to think that work is outside of the faith life, right? Some, some have maybe heard the term the sacred-secular divide, okay? Now, we know that we spend most of our, our time in life working, right? Over 50% of our life. It's where we spend the majority of our waking hours, okay? It's where we face the majority of our challenges to living out our faith, and it happens to also be where we engage in the majority of our relationships, right? I kind of call this the three majorities. Marketplace happens to be the fourth largest uh, unreached people group, and also the greatest opportunity to, to, to influence people on a weekly basis. So, one thing I didn't tell you in the beginning, though, this is my family. This is Tricia, uh, Ryan, and Braden's our little uh, eight-year-old. But it wasn't always that pretty, okay? 
So issues from Monday Morning Atheist and some of the issues you may be sharing around the table but kind of amplified quite a bit caused me uh, 14 years ago to lose my family. So I lost my family and had to walk through the valley of a Monday Morning Atheist and as God kind of retooled me and took me to the woodshed and showed me a lot of things about my life and character and things like that. But he redeemed all that and just, uh, just an amazing, amazing family and amazing testimony that... Uh, um, but let's watch this. Uh, let's watch this issue. I want you to see if you have this issue, and this is from Asia, so you're not going to be able to understand the language, but you'll get it. And I want you to think computer, and I want you to think computer mouse. Okay, so watch this. Ching. Hectic work life, right? <laughs> so the truth about this, right? The only sum of life is that it all belongs to God, right? And you and I are managers of his creation. So my story, I'm going to tell you a little story about my collapse into another collapse into Monday Morning Atheist. I have a, a bunch of them, but I, um, I, was, I, call this, I call this one, Here I Go Again, all right? So I had a company in San Diego, and I remember uh, we would develop intellectual uh, property and capital and in the energy field, right? But I had a problem is that by the time we found this, and we'd dig through all the public relation or public uh, utility codes and stuff and develop these, you know, c computer models. And we'd find ways that the big utilities, you know, PG&E and SCE and, you know, PG, you know, and San Diego Gas and Electric were ripping off corporations, okay? And we found a lot of it, right? Millions and millions of dollars. But the problem is I, we couldn't get to the market fast enough because the 800-pound gorilla would squish us. I mean, because they had this perception of, like, we're here to help you, but they're, they're charging a half a penny more and just making tons, right? So I found this, uh, this, uh, this problem that, that the utilities were happening, we had, and we moved, but I, had a, I, I need to find a marketing partner to actually hit the market fast enough, and so I started looking for marketing partners. I found this, this organization in, uh, in Newport Beach, and I uh, started negotiating with them, and I was going to license this intellectual capital to them so that they could, they were great marketers and stuff, and they, they could actually market to, uh, to all these corporations and manufacturers and stuff like that. So, but as I was negotiating, I, uh, I, I would study, and I was so, I love God. I wanted to serve him, you know, and I used to study Larry Burkett's business by the book. It was like my second Bible, and I was very in tune with being unequally yoked and all this stuff. And, but yet, I would negotiate, and I remember one time I was in Newport Beach, and uh, man, things were just not going well. I mean, I started getting money signs, and I slowly started to have this, this kind of spiritual schizophrenia. It was, it was so subtle, I couldn't even notice it, but I started to, my faith life and my decisions in business started to sort of separate. Things were kind of going bad. I mean, I started getting sick. I remember the time that I thought, you know, just when that deal, you think the deal's done, and then all of a sudden it blows up again, right? And uh, so it was over for that night. I walked out of that office at 11 o'clock at night, and I was just, I couldn't even drive. I, I just felt delirious. It was pouring down rain, I remember. And then I, I just thought, you know, I can't drive back to San Diego. So I went and I looked for a hotel room and found this, you know, I tried to find a hotel room, and there was no room in the inn. There was some convention, and, you know, and uh, Newport Beach, and so I ended up having to pay for this room that I'd never pay for because I just couldn't even hardly stand. And I went in there, and uh, I, I went for the Bible. I grabbed the Bible off the nightstand, the Gideon Bible, right, and opened it up, and it went right to Proverbs 1 where it says, Son, son when sinners entice you, do not walk along their path. Turn from, I mean, I had a, a rhema word from God. I was looking for that. God, tell me what to do. So what do you think I did? Okay, there's so many signs that like God was trying to save me and turn away. So the next morning I called up the CEO of that other and I, I renegotiated the terms, you know, trying to honor God, but kind of making another little adjustment. And then I signed the deal and I went on my way. Right. And so it only took about nine weeks. And within that nine week period, they stole a million dollars from us. Okay. So. Sometimes that switch can be like a dimmer. You know, it just slowly, you know what that feels like, right? Slowly goes off. And uh, 
And I've had, I've had situations like that where I'm trying to serve God, but you know, you know how hard it is sometimes to hear God and discern the voice of the God and to make decisions on that. And that's, uh, that's something that's uh, really important to do. So that's the first one. The second one, my work is just a waste. It's just a paycheck for me, okay? That's a fundamental misunderstanding about why God created work in the first place. Monday morning atheism leads us to believe that, it, that our task and our daily work may be worthless in the eyes of God. We think that our jobs are too pointless or otherwise too empty to be meaningful. So, C.S. Lewis once said that a sense of divine vision must be restored to man's daily work. Did you know that uh, the very first man that the Bible records as being filled with the Spirit of God was a worker? If you go back to Exodus in 31, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, silver, bronze, and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. Exodus 31. Now, there's some biblical insights that we've learned just looking through the Bible. And uh, you know that uh, the Bible, the work is mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible, okay? More than, than the words used to express worship, music, praise, singing combined, okay? In the New Testament of Jesus' 132 public appearances, 122 were in the Agora or the marketplace, all right? 52 parables, 45 had a workplace context. 40 divine interventions, approximately 39 we're in the workplace. Go back and reread the Bible and look at that. There's another thing I want to share with you that kind of rocked my world that um, uh, a few years ago. And uh, I think we, you know, I was listening to a sermon or something on, uh, on the kingdom of God and the Bama seat of Christ. And, and so we're in 1 Corinthians, and, and we, I'm just going to read this here. It says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work, and I want to talk about that in just a second, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Okay, And if what has been built survives, the builder receives a reward. And if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, okay? This is known as the Bama Seat of Christ, right? The gaze of Christ that examines your and I's work. Here it is, Jesus. Here's everything I've done in business and work. Here's what I've done for you, okay? But what struck me is that, you know, I've read through the Bible in that whole word of work in the Bible. It's all over the place, right? But because of my religious upbringing, I always read that work and I think, you know, the good works, right? I think it's going on missions, right? Or working at the soup kit, you know, those kind of context when I think about work. So I haven't studied Greek. You know, there's some people in the room that have studied, maybe some of you have studied Greek, but who knows what this word is, right? I know there's some over here that know. It's ergon, right? So that word work, uh, in that context is the word Aragon. Now, I, uh, it's a little intimidating here, man, because I know there's some Talbot and stuff, so I don't want you to challenge me on my Greek, all right? So here's the deal. If anybody challenges me on my Greek, I'm going to challenge you on the, on the fission formula for uranium-235. <laughs> all right, so let's just get that clear, and I'm going to proceed after this, all right? I want you to look at this night. This looks like Greek to you, but, you know. Aragon, all right, Aragon. Now listen to this. Aragon is used 176 times in 161 verses in the New Testament, okay? It's where we get that word ergonomics, right, the mechanical way we work, our posture and all of that. Now, I knew that uh, I actually ripped the book out of, or ripped the page out of Strong's Concordance and actually put it up here because I just want you to read it for yourself. Okay? So here's the, here's the Greek New Testament uh, definition of Aragon. All right? Hunter, listen, look at it down below there if you can see it on the screen. All right? Number one, it means business, employment, that which anyone is occupied. Number, right there, that which one undertakes to do, enterprise or undertaking, 
Number or right there, any, pr any product, whatever, anything accomplished by hand, art, industry, or mind. And then the third one there, um, it doesn't always mean work. Sometimes there are, there, are, there are some occasions where it means a general act or a deed. Now, with that definition of work and enterprise and business, let's go back and read that, okay? And I'm going to show you a couple other scriptures, okay? For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work, their business, their, your job will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, the gaze of Christ. The fire will test the quality of each person's work. Okay? Okay. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet be saved. So he's talking to us believers, all right? So this word, Aragon, is also used in some other, other like Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your, your job, the way you work, your business, right? And glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Another, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures, God breathed in youthful teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, ergon. So look that up yourself and go back through the New Testament, you know, a lot of verses and stuff, and you'll, you'll read those in a little bit different way when you, when you just look at the definition of Aragon and you, your mind won't toggle like mine always did for so long just to work besides what you and I do every day out in the marketplace, okay? We call this spiritual ergonomics, right? The spiritual way uh, that we work. So what we learned here, the truth is God delights in what we do. He's designed us uniquely and he enjoys our work like a father. We have one more short circuit. Okay, and that's called I'm, I'm alone and it's all up to me. And that's, you know, the chapter in the book we call The Absent God, all right? That was the third short circuit that we kind of pulled together from all this research that showed, you know, of these three short circuits that cause us to kind of toggle over and switch God off. Now, this one, Monday morning atheism operates with a self-sufficient, got to do it myself attitude. How many people struggle with that, right? Got to do, got to push through it. God's not going to show up. I'm not going to wait for him. Where are you, God? And uh, it accepts the lie that God is distant or maybe even absent altogether. And I really, really struggle with this, man. Sometimes in life in general, you know, it reminded me of Jacob, a story we, we, we talk about in the book where, remember where, where Jacob finally wrestled with God so long and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. So, some of my roots in this come from the fact that I sometimes just don't trust that God's supernatural. That he really has the ability to actually speak to me or to show up like in that business deal that I was telling you about just a, a minute ago. And so God's really taken me to the woodshed over, I don't know, probably the last uh, 10 years in this area. I'm going to share one of those with you that uh, has been kind of dramatic for me and the Lord just will... He won't leave me alone in this area. And uh, so here's what happened to me, okay? About the time that I told you in that whole, uh, that whole situation, I, uh, and this is just a part of me understanding that God deeply loves me. And he's willing to speak to me and go to lengths. And he's never, he never leaves me nor forsakes me, okay? And so I was... Uh, I was uh, wrestling with some of these concepts and, and, and this Monday morning atheism and stuff, and, and particularly this one about being self-sufficient, and, you know, and I realized the root of it, you know, and our research showed this too, is that I just didn't really trust. I just felt like God wasn't there. I mean, just, you know, you know how that feels, man. You're working, you're working hard, and all of a sudden it's just not there. So, um, and I just, I'd never really seen God move supernaturally. You know, I'm talking like, what we see in the Bible, and I've always wanted that, right? So uh, I, uh, back in 2003, March the 3rd, I was awoke in the middle of the night, and I looked over at the clock, and it's, it's, it's 3.33, okay, 3.33 in the morning. And, uh, and I thought that was interesting, but then the next night, 
all of a sudden I'm jarred awake and, and it's 3.33. And I also felt, I, I sensed the presence of God. You ever had that where God wakes you up and you're like, hmm, Lord, and you, you know, and you start trying to hear him and listen. So that was interesting, but then the next night he jars me awake. And I start, I get, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly thick-headed, but I start thinking, man, something is going on here. God woke me up for almost six months at 3.33. About two, about two weeks into this, I'm digging through Scripture, and I finally realize that God's speaking to me, and he led me to Jeremiah 33.3, 3.3.3, all right, which answered exactly what I was struggling with. And it says, call out to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you or show you unsearchable things that you do not know. So I thought, that's interesting. So God continues to wake me up. So after that two-week period I led this, all of a sudden, 333. And all of a sudden, the God of the universe is actually knocking on my door saying, Doug, get up. Now, I didn't like it that it was 333 in the morning, all right? But I would start to get up and just start crying out and calling out to God. And then he would start to show me these unsearchable things. You know, in the Hebrew, that, that word unsearchable, or some, some translation says he'll show you great and mighty things, it actually means fenced in things or boxed in things, things that are veiled in the earthly realm. You know how we always want, we want to hear God so that we can exercise his will in the earth realm, right? So he started to show me this and promise me that he would do this. So I started walking this out in the workplace. And then God started manifesting in ways that I never knew that this supernatural God that saved me could do. So let me show you some of those. I would drive places and be going to some place, and the address would be 333. And I would stop, and I would just start crying out to God. And then he would download answers to me, and then I would have answers on how to actually do the business deal or execute. So I was like, wow, this is a novel thing, man. I listened to God. Now, I'm a little, you know, sending me mail. I, I appreciated that because, you know, before it was like, God, where are you, right? Let me give you a couple more. I'd pull into the, I'd pull into the store. No joke, I take pictures of these. I got thousands of them on my iPhone because people won't believe me, so I just take them. Everywhere I travel, everything it's already happened here. Just start praying, and God starts revealing himself, okay? I pull into CVS, and the water's $3.33, okay? I came out on a business trip from, uh, from, uh, from Atlanta. Car pulls in front of me, 333. I'll go to buy golf balls. God says, you can't outrun me. I'm here. Wherever you go, I'm here. I'm present with you, okay? I'll go to the grocery store, go to get something. It'll be $3.33. I'll pull in to get gas. It'll be $3.33. My family, we just stop and start crying out to God. We just start crying out to God. I've had absolutely amazing things. I remember one time we left my house in Atlanta, and we were going down to some free timeshare in Panama City. And so we left, and we're driving, and you kind of, I hadn't been through Alabama before, but I was like, you get lost in Dothan, and I was all over the place, and I finally got back on track. I was trying to get through a Dothan, and there was a, you know, one stop light in the city, and I, I, I stopped, and uh, I said, Tricia, look at that. And the jumbotron right in the middle of the city is, is 333. So my, our family, we just start crying out to God. I mean, uh, I wish I had time to tell you the things that have happened in my family uh, because of this. So, interesting thing, God just keeps one up in us. So I start getting this swagger saying, God, come on, let's do it again. And he'll say, all right, let's go. And so when you start trusting God and actually calling, you know, calling out to him and asking him, he'll, he'll answer you. And it's just been an absolutely amazing supernatural kind of walk. So what happens, we had the jumbotron, get back in the car and we make it down the floor after seven hours. And I told you we got lost and all this stuff. As soon as the bumper of my car pulled into the, you know, the, the part or the, the driveway that goes into this Marriott, my trip odometer turns over from my driveway all the way through getting lost, turns over to 333 miles. We stop and start just praising God and worshiping. So listen to this. So um, I, went over to, I went over to Asia last year, and I said, God, when I speak to these pastors and these business leaders, I, 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 
I want, I want you to supernaturally, you know, just absolutely blow these people away and show them how much you love them, right? So I'm doing research on the place that we're going to have this conference and stuff. Come to find out the electric transmission grid that supplies that whole area was exactly 333 megawatts, okay? Now listen to this. I got on the plane and uh, I said, I'm, we're, over, we're over, I'm flying from Atlanta to Seoul, South Korea, 15 hours. We're over to the North Pole. And I said, God, can you do a miracle for me? And so, uh, so I'm waiting. I don't know how he's going to show up, but I know he's going to because I've been walking this out for, for years now and watching him do supernatural things and just other things that are just, you know, I'd love to be able to tell you. But so I'm on this plane. We're at 47,000 feet. I mean, we're way up there, right? And so I flip, I flip the screen over. I'm on my navigation screen, and I flip over to a music track. Music track's three, min, you know, three minutes and 33 seconds, okay? So I said, all right, God, come on. Let me see. Do you know that within five minutes, I went back to the navigation screen, and God leveled the plane at 33,300 feet. Now, I landed in, in Malaysia, and... I got into the security line, and the security line was 333. Now listen to this. I was in Kuala Lumpur, and I had to fly to another location. And I got up, and I said, God, will you do it again for me, would you? I picked up my bag. I walked into security, full headdress, Muslims, you know, and the, and the thing. And I handed her my passport, and I looked at her security badge, and I said 333, right? This is a picture of her security badge, right? And she goes, you know, in broken English, excuse me. And I said, I said, 333. Then I made a dumb American mistake, okay? Because I take pictures of all these, right? I ask a Muslim woman if I could take a picture of her chest, okay? <laughs> that created a stink. The male security guards came over, started kind of stirring his stuff. And all I knew to do is open my iPhone, and I started, I started showing them pictures of what, of what God was doing. Changed the whole atmosphere. These Muslim security guards, they all started crying out 333. Just declaring 333. It was absolutely amazing. Changed the whole atmosphere. Uh, flew over to this other island. As soon as I got off the plane, man, the building we were going to was 333. Here's my room number when I check in, 333. And so, and then the billionaire golf, uh, the guy that owned the resort, after I got done speaking, he paid for my golf. I went over, put my tee in the ground, and I said, God, you have to be kidding me. The hole was exactly 333 meters. So all I'm trying to show you is that, that God is a supernatural God, and he's greatly interested in actually speaking and walking with you in a very, very intimate way. I mean, come on. I mean, I want to see God's power. You know what I mean? I want to see his power on earth. And so I know some of this I'm kind of challenging a little bit, but I'll stop these. But I, I get excited on this stuff because I just got gas coming here. I mean, it was, you know, $33.31. Go down the road. It'll be exit 333. I showed up for a 5K race. Lady came up right beside me, 333. So it gets a little overwhelming after a while, right? But you start to realize, man, that God is, is, man, he just, he loves you so much. And he wants to walk with you at work. And this is just, this is my story. This is my little story about me depending on God and learning to trust him to where I don't have to actually do it all. Now you think with all this, man, I wouldn't have trouble, but I do still. I have a lot of trouble. One last story. My friend who's a CEO in Atlanta, uh, Hey, people I, start, people I tell this to, it start, it, it, God starts manifesting. But I, uh, I went, uh, he had his son-in-law went in the hospital. I'm trying to find it again here. And, uh, yeah, his son-in-law went in the hospital, and he had, brain, he had potential brain damage and stuff like that. And they were talking to the neurosurgeon. And come to find out that, uh, and he just texted me this the other week, that when someone goes into a coma, their delta waves in their brain kind of slow way down and do all this stuff. And uh, he said that, that this neurosurgeon said it's really interesting. People that, uh, that actually kind of start speaking Jesus and stuff, 
that their delta waves go and start, and he just told, he didn't know any of this stuff. He says, it starts repeating a pattern of 333. This, this neurosurgeon told my friend. That night, his, his son, or his, yeah, his, not son-in-law, but his uh, adopted son, had heart surgery and all this brain stuff. And his EKG thing, you know, the, the guy said, I've never seen this. It's stuck on 333 all night long. I mean, it was just an amazing thing that happened in the hospital. And uh, so I'm going to move on here and just, uh, so the end goal is that God promises that you are never alone, as you can tell just from my story, and that, that he will work through you, okay? So those are the three short circuits. Um, I told you a little bit about how the process works. I, I, your seven-day challenge is to actually read the book, carry your switch, check your resistance, okay? Get that. And then, uh, and then remember some of the things that we've, uh, we've talked about. This is a picture of StopTheSwitch.com. You can click that button there and actually take that profile. Um, there's some other assets that you can find online that we've created with this. So I think that's, uh, that's all. This is a picture of the work-life profile. But it's been great to be with you, and uh, thank you for letting me share. And, uh, and uh, God bless you, and God bless your work, okay? Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.